All right, so the um, next panel, as I noted, the last one actually of this morning is focusing on the builder's perspective. Uh, similar set of questions, roughly speaking, what are the uh, challenges and opportunities uh, when we want to increase the impact of open resources on education, but this time from, from a builder's perspective. It's a fantastic panel with a wonderful moderator, um, great friend, Katerina Marake from Kai University, again a partner um, in crime over many years already, a close collaborator um, with the Berkman Center. Of course, Katerina uh, has also a rich experience in, uh, from other contexts, including Creative Commons, where she served as the international director, so lots of expertise from actually really um, the supplier's side. Um, it's a very special day for Katerina too because it's actually her birthday. I will not sing, but happy birthday. And uh, I know you're leaving tonight, so it's not the most practical gift, but a symbolic <laughs> gift. And uh, we owe you uh, more flowers when we're back in Tokyo. Thank you. So with that, over to you, Katerina. on stage because I hate to be on stage, especially by myself. <laughs> I can talk here, I think, yeah. Um, yeah, welcome back, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you all here for what I think um, is a very important topic when we talk about open educational resources and looking at, at open educational resources from the different stakeholder perspectives, which is our panel um, talking about the builder's perspective. So the first question I ask myself when looking at these different um, stakeholders is what exactly is the difference? So what is the difference between learners, facilitators, and builders? And especially what's the difference between learners and builders? And I personally think there's not much difference. There's actually huge overlap. And that becomes clear when we think about the way how we create materials and how we produce materials. Because we're not only producing it out of anything, we are learning from others, from colleagues, from students. We are using materials by creating new materials. So I personally think there is a lot of overlap and, and a lot of you know, similarities between this. There is one difference, especially between the learners and the builders perspective, which is that as a builder, if you look at it from the supply chain perspective, we have the responsibility, we have the choice to think about how we want to make the stuff available. So do we want to encourage others to use it? Do we encourage other to, others to um, use it efficiently for collaboration and so on and so forth? Or do we just want to have it out there? And I recall quite well a longish discussion I had with a colleague of mine a while ago. Um, what is the priority for OER in the future? Is the priority to just make more materials available? Or is the priority to think about the ways how we make it available? And what kind of license we are using, what kind of infrastructure we are building, and so on and so forth. These are two questions that I would like to discuss with um, the panel. There's one more issue I just briefly want to raise, and that's um, the perspectives of the different learning environments. So when we look at OER, is it that the future is really about the informal learning environments? And I know that Philip Schmidt is here, so the peer-to-peer -peer university is probably the most successful example and project for the informal learning environment where OER can play a very important role. But what kind of role can open educational resources play in the formal learning environment? And yesterday, someone put it quite accurately, I think, in a question in the beginning of the heat map discussion, where is the link between O and E in the OER term? So these are only a few questions that I would like to raise. Um, we discussed briefly last night. We actually would love to have much more involvement with the audience. We just want to make it very brief with the statements and then run around and get your input and questions so that we have a little bit more of a discussion um, compared to the other sessions that we had this morning. Um, let me start with a brief introduction of our distinguished panel. We have um, Hal Abelson. Hal is a professor of electrical engineering and computer science at MIT. 
and he's also a founding director of both Creative Commons and the Free Software Foundation. So he is a long-term expert in the area of openness. We have um, S.J. Klein. He is, I, for me, the face behind the um, One Laptop Per Child project. He's the director of Outreach for the foundation. But he has also created various Wikipedia projects and he serves on the board for the Wikimedia Foundation. And last but not least, we have a close friend of mine and a colleague and a long-term expert also in the area of OER. He has, I think, dedicated more than half um, a decade of his life to work in this field. He's a project manager at MIDI, which is the um, institute, the Monterey Institute for Technology and Education. Um, he also is a consultant for various foundations and projects. And he serves on the board of different um, uh, foundations and different institutions and peer-to-peer -peer university, just to mention one. So I think we are in the circle of the family here. So with this, um, maybe I can start and ask Hal, would you like to briefly give sure. us a statement or an overview? And then we can move on with a very short um, thoughts of okay. you before we run around and take your questions. OK. Um. So this part of the conference is supposed to be about the state of play in OER, and we're supposed to be giving the tech perspective. And Katarina also said we're supposed to be short and that we're supposed to provoke people into a discussion. So let me see if I can do all of that. Um, let me start a little personally. Uh, so as you know, the, the whole name Open Educational Resources comes from the UNESCO conference early, early in this millennium that was talking about things based on MIT OpenCourseWare and the like. So I was uh, present at the start of OpenCourseWare along with the start of Creative Commons. They happened very much together. So I can say I was one of the people present at the creation. And from that perspective, let me kind of say how I see the OER field. Uh, first thing I want to say is I see it incredibly expansive and uh, and being really successful. If, it's a good thing I didn't make slides. I would have made the same slides that Kathy did. You know, even in the last week, right, we saw the, the stuff from South Africa. We saw the stuff from Poland. We saw the stuff from UNESCO. Kathy already described that. And I want to say, wow, that's, that's really great. So as a movement, we are starting, we're starting to win. But you know what happens that when movements expand, they they kind of shift a little bit towards the center. They get big. They get big. The initial founding visions get diluted a bit. Um, it was great that Joey started off with this, this sort of very non-establishment view of education. And what I really learned this morning is that I'm absolutely in love with Vicki Davis. Yeah, Vicki, you. you <laughs> wonderful, because Vicki used, Vicky used the, the magic word, which is empowerment. And I want to distinguish the kind of stuff that Joey and Vicky were saying from what I see as the, the influences and the pressures on OER. Because the pressure on OER right now is to move towards the mainstream. In the case of OER, we're seeing more and more, you have to pay attention to the people who want to use this stuff. You've got to make it easy to find, easy to use, and not nearly enough to the infrastructure about making it easy to make. And that's really what, and I just feel that that emphasis is getting a little bit towards, uh, to use the word Vicky said, towards consumerism. Not consumerism of the kids, but making this easy to stuff to digest and not really thinking about where the next generation of stuff is supposed to come from. See, from my perspective, what's really good about open educational resources, it's not that you can kind of get them without paying money or something, or not even that you can, you can make lots of uses of them. It's that it is really, really easy to make incremental improvements. Because the promise of open educational resources is that the stuff should get better. And the way it gets better is by making it easy for lots and lots of people to make it better. So when I put on my computer science hat, you know how you make things better is by making standard interfaces to small pieces. Here, Joey talked this morning about small pieces loosely joined. We don't have that. We don't have a way 
that if you take some piece of curriculum unit or a piece of test, a way that, that uh, one of Vicky's kids can put something not only in, in a wiki someplace, but back really into the common. Uh, you heard a lot of talk. You, you're right, what, what's, the, what's the standard example? The standard example everybody shouts is Wikipedia. Right? What is it that makes Wikipedia great? What's the thing that let it get off the ground? It's the fact that you can sit there and edit a little bit of stuff, and then it goes back into the corpus of Wikipedia. We're not thinking about it enough. So in terms of where the Hewlett Foundation should be looking, with all the people talking about make it easy to find, there's a whole other technological agenda, which is make it easy to in so that everybody can incrementally improve this thing. Um, let me say one more thing. Another provocative thing, talking about Wikipedia. What is it that let Wikipedia get off the ground? What is the thing that let it sustain? If you look at the license on Wikipedia, it's share alike. And one of the things I see, and from Creative Commons and from, from me and all of us on the Creative Commons board, is really starting to recommend taking off the share alike provision and saying we want to make this as open and as easy to use as possible. And you have to kind of ask ourselves, why are we doing that? Is that because we're trying to become popular? Or is that because we're trying to build a commons? And I think we as, I think now a successful movement, I mean really, OER is becoming, is successful. We have to think about what is it that we want? Do we want a lot of people to use it? Do we want the broadest tent possible? Or do we want to make sure that this notion of real sharing and real improvement and really building a common stays there. Ultimately, maybe people want to comment on that, but I think that's a critical issue in how we go forward. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I love going after hell. <laughs> I just want to second that, that essence of collaboration. I love the comment earlier today, the quote, we're from Fukushima, we're here to help. That's the spirit of learners becoming the facilitators and the builders. And that's what the internet has, has made. That's our modern culture. Um, our job is to help make that easy, to help make that possible. I don't like lecturing. I want to flip this engagement a little bit. So I posted my ideas and questions on the, on the etherpad for the event. I hope everyone can go there and spend the next half hour just focusing on how we build things together. Please edit those questions, come up with ideas, draft the things you're going to ask us in a few minutes. I just have one comment to make, and, uh, and I want to give you one anecdote, mainly because I wanted a reason to show pictures of more children. We don't have very many children here. Uh, the comment is, is related. It's that K through 12 has really lagged behind uh, higher education when it comes to OER investment and thinking and even the philosophy we espouse. But many more students go through primary education, and there are many fewer topics to cover. So that's something we can all, we can all move towards uh, together. <laughs> These are, these are students in, in Peru. I work with elementary students in rural places all around the world. And uh, the part that I like best is that when they have an excuse to get together and to make something and then to post it, they're so excited. I mean, it's the best thing in the world for them. And the teachers, in part because they recognize that, and in part because they're doing unusual things. This is a class which every year would do uh, environmental studies in their community. It's hard for them to get that from the texts and the workbooks that are out there. So th they were just getting online uh, through old PC, through one laptop per child, and they had access to hundreds of books that were theoretically relevant for them. But uh, the teachers ended up using Wikipedia for most of their classroom projects because they could find something that was granular enough that related to what they had to do. And when it didn't cover what they cared about, they could go and update the source and then just reuse it with their students. So they loved that. And when the students found out about this, the students went and posted information about their town. They got very into it. So thank you. You want to use the slides? We have a few quick comments. Um, I'll start off with a, a short thought as a preface. We often talk in education that if you're teaching, but then your students didn't learn anything, were you really teaching? <laughs> Similarly, if you're innovating and nobody actually uses what you built, were you really innovating? So thinking from a builder's perspective, when you ordered your new computer, was this what you had in mind? Or maybe that? For OER, you were seeking algebra OER. Did you have this notion that you were going to collect this miscellaneous bunch of objects, and that was the thing you were seeking? Or were you seeking 
something fairly neat, pre-assembled and tidy, or maybe something in between. So just echoing what you heard from SJ and how I think builders in particular are really struggling to understand their responsibility to the communities we serve. Just sending people to the internet and saying, look at all the excitement, get in, <laughs> start playing. We're finding it's not very useful, but maybe, maybe that's the point. <laughs> maybe what we're trying to do is not build, to sort of counteract what Hal said a little bit, the best stuff. Maybe we're just trying to build things that enable pedagogies, ways of learning, collaborating, and so on, that we couldn't do before, at least not very easily. And so I would just ask a few questions. OER for whom? OER for what? And how? And then we'll talk. Thanks. Well, a big thank you to the, to the panelists. Um, I would say uh, the floor is yours. Uh, we would like to get your input and take your questions on this. And maybe we take two questions and then, you know, hand the microphone right so that they can, the panelists can actually have input on that. No, that's okay. Uh, Ariel Diaz with Boundless Learning. Uh, and I thought you guys had some, some great points. And one thing that I, everyone kind of touched on from a slightly different angle is how to build some of the great products and how to continue improving that. And one thing that you know, I think the community as a whole struggles with is how to do that while still being uh, fragmented and not in a bad way, but you know, while, with having multiple platforms that are all trying to leverage OER, um, it's a logistical challenge to continue to improving that. And I think one thing that Wikipedia does in particular is centralizing those efforts. So it just, you know, I'd be interested in thoughts on how to keep the spirit of this fragmented content while also trying to create great products and uh, centralize the, the innovation and improvement of the content itself, you know, and, you know how to balance that. Uh, Creative Commons thinks about removing obstacles. So, so Ariel, when you talk about that, there are tech, there's technology and then there's kind of sociology. So in technology, I think the path is actually pretty clear. It's the way that, it, it's the way you build modular structures in any large system. There's that, there's that great book by, uh, by the dean of, of the Harvard Business School, right, called Design Rules, which talks about modularity. You talk about interoperable standards. You talk about all sorts of boring computer science-y kinds of stuff, right? The real question is what's the social issue about how do you feel about the fact that you make something and you put it into Wikipedia and it goes into you largely anonymously. How do you get the people who are going to be the contributors to either have an infrastructure where they get some recognition? So remember in Creative Commons when we started, it did not have a share alike provision. And what we found is that 95% of the people who wanted to put a Creative Commons license on the thing Wanted, wanted to have an attribution provision on there. And why was that? Because we were going to the universities and you know, faculty and universities pretend they're not, they're not worried about money or credit, but you know, attribution is money to faculty members. So everybody said, oh, we'll put an attribution license in it. And now in Creative Commons, you can't even not get an attribution license. And the question is, how does that compare with the world of something like Wikipedia, where people are happy to do things anonymously? And again, when you think about what's your view about you're building a commons, what's it mean that you're taking a commons? Is a commons, here's this cathedral and here's the brick with my name on it? Or is the commons a big thing that's made by all of us? And I don't think the answer is obvious and I think that's something we ought to be thinking about. So your question goes right to the core of this. I would say build shared namespaces, plan for collaboration from the start. When you plan for collaboration, that should mean think about how you expect things to merge with other things. Don't oversell ownership so that people are, are scared and their expectations are shattered when that happens. And just you as the owner of one piece of this very diverse puzzle should define who you expect to interact with, whose namespaces you expect to merge with over time. Set that as a community standard and then everyone will know. And I, in my experience, when people know that coming into some kind of project, they're very happy when it happens. And if they don't know it, they're, they're surprised and unhappy. Gary Matkin from University of California, Irvine. Uh, OER seems to work better uh, 
when you know what you want to know. Uh, the, the problem in getting some people more use, I think, is that people just sometimes have a very general idea of what they want to know, and they lack a map or a way to enter a general field, like, say, modernist architecture or something. Uh, as you build things, do you think about the map that helps people focus on a particular subject and choose from among options within a field? I'll say no one's updated the Encyclopedia Britannica Propedia in, in a long time. And sadly, people ended up not using it to find knowledge. Um, so when an organization builds a central one of those maps, they often don't get used. But if you let people build their own map as it matters to them, and suddenly you have the map that applies to everything related to Fukushima, that works really well. So if, you're, if, you're, if your space is flexible enough that people can actually change the space itself, and the people who care about, about an introduction to that kind of architecture can build the introduction, you end up, you end up developing things over time that, that are really meaningful to people looking for that knowledge. Um, I would just say, certainly for MITEI, you know, frankly, the curricular structure we've had forever is actually pretty useful for that. Uh, in K-12, they still, you know, if there are physics concepts they need to know, then they turn to what's understood and has been understood for ages, what the physics curriculum looks like. So that actually serves as a very useful guide for people to then get in the ballpark for what they need. What we're probably not marrying well with OER as a community is what is our conception of what they're going to find when they get there? So is it just another physics textbook that happens to have some different properties? Or is there a diversity of options within a specific topic that kind of shows proof, I guess, of the claim that we're trying to build lots of different ways of getting a handle on a concept? Um, or is it a I don't know, is it an ecosystem where maybe you encourage them to build something themselves that just you know, happens to get at that topic they're interested in? But certainly for K-12, you know, we don't need to throw out like, the definition of a discipline. It's actually a very useful starting point. I'm David Harris with Connections, and I work mostly in the higher ed side. And uh, Howell talked earlier about crossing over into the mainstream, and that makes movements a little bit more conservative. So I'd just like to hear your opinions on the notion of adaptation. I think when we look at early OER, adaptation was the driving <coughs> force, the major reason for adoption. But as you cross into the mainstream, you just mentioned um, the physics book. Faculty don't have a lot of time to go and assemble lots of different pieces. And so my question is, is do you think we're going to move from a period of adapt to adopt to for then providing people with uh, adoption to adapt so that we give them a lot more turnkey and then that will drive innovation because they can add resources around it? Yeah, I mean, so I think I'm answering your question. <laughs> uh, when you, especially when you ther heard from the previous panel, and I'm thinking in particular of the teachers, the flipped classroom and the teachers making videos and, and that sort of thing. And then there was this talk about constraints. We have to, I think it's useful to remember that many of those constraints have a really good reason for being there, or at least people think they do. Uh, and a big one for the constraints on massive innovation, teachers going out and finding whatever, building so on, is, is one that really just boils down to trust. So who do taxpayers or the community or whomever trust to actually spend the money that's been set aside for education in like, reasonable ways? Um, and unfortunately, the way that kind of enforcement mentality, we must ensure nobody cheats, tends to play out as policies get passed. We empower certain people to make those decisions. They're presumably under some duress to do it well, right? So there's a lot of elements of that that need to be dealt with first before I think we're really going to see the moment when we celebrate empowering teachers and say, yes, we trust you as the proper agents to make this decision. Um, ideally, technology plays a role in that. The way, so one approach we've taken is to really just say that as an organization that's focused on production, we know that we can bring the right people together to validate or produce something that is high quality and has integrity and is actually accurate. And then we try to build them to a small enough size 
that when we hand them to the teachers, they see that they can mix and match them and rearrange them, adapt them, so to speak, but at, a, it, I guess, a level of granularity that doesn't destroy all the values that were embedded in their creation. And we're finding that to be a very effective way of sort of turning those screws, getting teachers to understand we are giving you the power to make these decisions. But by making those decisions, you're not undermining the trust that the broader institution has in expecting you to use valid materials, things that are accurate, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe that's a stepping stone to the grander vision of just build it yourself. We're going to trust you at that level. I don't really know, but that's, we're kind of threading that needle right now. Um, I actually think it's a complementary question and it's a question that I also wanted to ask to Joy early today because I think we are thinking a lot about how to reshape our spaces, like mm -hmm. physically, right? And for me, there is a tension now in the OER movement because uh, it's funny to see that many of us uh, are going back to build test books, right? And we struggle with space, we struggle with uh, rethinking how we put our tables in our classroom and how to engage kids building things, but then we go back to test books. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is a necessary movement to communicate with the, act, the current system uh, uh, to, re, uh, to, to uh, understand again the incentive systems and maybe to, all, to, 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 to move in the future to a more flexible way? So how do you see this tension in the OER movement, right? We, co we have a lot of critics to the traditional system, but we are still going back to test books, right? I know about all the legitimacy and trust, and et cetera, but how do you see that in like five, 10 years? You know, what is the role of the open test books in this? Let's maybe take one more question before we get back that makes it more efficient. Um, uh, Pete Forsyth uh, with Wiki Strategies. Uh, I wanted to, to pick up on the point that uh, Hal Abelson was making about, um, about the significance of attribution uh, in projects like Wikipedia. Uh, and I just I want to suggest that uh, something that we, I, I don't think we really uh, think or talk about enough in terms of motivation with something like Wikipedia is not, not attribution, but um, uh, is the quality of the learning community. Um, and and as, a, as, a, as a Wikipedian, I mean, in my background, I, was, I sort of had the, the privilege of going to what's considered one of the better uh, public high schools in the country right here in Newton. I went to what uh, a lot of people would consider one of the better, better uh, liberal arts uh, conference-based uh, colleges, Reed College. And I would say neither comes close to the quality of the learning community that I've experienced in Wikipedia by, um, you know, experiences like working on an article about something I'm learning about, and then coming back and finding out that someone else improved it while I was gone, and that that person is interested in engaging in discussion. Uh, I'm learning things from them, I'm teaching things to them, I'm building relationships. Um, and I think that, you know, alongside the concept of att attribution, I think we would really do well to explore, um, you know, how do we make that kind of experience accessible to more people? Because my path to finding that was not necessarily an easy one or an easy one to replicate, but we should be looking for ways to replicate. I, th I think that if you combine that with what Ariel said, is a, a central critical question for us as a community. Because when you put something into Wikipedia, or someone puts something into Wikipedia, part of the motivation is that there's this thing called Wikipedia. And you said, wow, I made it better. Right? Ariel says, do you want that world of centralized things, or do you want 100 Wikipedias? You have to ask yourself whether 100 Wikipedias could exist. Would you get the same thing? And I, I, think this is, I think this is a really hard choice. I don't think it's as obvious at all, but it's something that we all should be thinking about. And for people who are guiding how the infrastructure is built, that's something we should be thinking about. And if we do break down knowledge and educational resources into what is infrastructure and what's layered on top and is really more interactive and, and a service of teachers and mentors in a community, the parts that are infrastructure should be centralized and we should all be supporting them. And they shouldn't be supported from education budgets, they should be supported from general government and civic budgets. And I think one of the things we can do as the visionaries who are showing people what openness can mean is to help pass that, that idea on. I, to quickly answer uh, the earlier question about why we're still coming back to approaching textbooks. I think OER today is definitely trying to prove something in the, along the lines of, of traditional education. And we could, in some ways, we're, the, we're making the biggest strides in places that don't consider themselves OER. They're saying, we're just going to go do something new, and this is a lot of fun. And the internet is a great, way, a great channel for transmitting fun. 
So Wikipedia certainly didn't think of itself as OER, to use your example. It just thought of itself as a group of people who wanted something that didn't exist, so they were going to go make it. And as it happens, it's used a lot in classes. I think if we, if we make sure we're supporting that as well as supporting these traditional things, beautiful, beautiful things will happen. Yeah, I, I guess I would echo that. I really think going after the mainstream means identifying the wedges, finding, finding ways in that allow objects that have greater abilities than perhaps they were originally conceived when they were adopted to then be discovered and leveraged. Um, and I mean, this may be a bad example, but I often think when people first started buying the iPod, they probably weren't thinking in their head, I'm never going to buy an album again, right? Like that wasn't, that wasn't the logic of buying the iPod. The iPod was this really cool thing that enabled them to listen to music. It was only once they had it in their hand and they started understanding the way they could engage their music in this completely different way in terms of the modularity of the media that they started thinking, gee, I could just get one song at a time. That's a that's just a different way of building relationships with your music and your bands and everything else. We're, we need to be coming up with similar models, I think, in OER, these sort of infection points where now all of a sudden people start thinking differently about what's possible. Uh, my, I'm Jeff Mao from the State of Maine, Department of Education. I just wanted to kind of toss out my thoughts on you know, we've been talking about kind of adoption of, of OER and how are we going to make this, you know, really move. And I'm speaking purely within the context of kind of K-12 United States, which is where, you know, my work is. And, and, I, and I think the environment of K-12 U.S. is very different than most places. So what needs to be done here may not need to be done elsewhere. Um, but I think what we need to look at, and, and there's been some comments today, for example, about, say, assessment. Too much testing, too much testing. We also wish we had less testing. Right, we're, we're teaching to the test, not good, these kinds of things. But I think we also need to think about some of the basic physics of all of this stuff. Right? There's inertia. And what we're looking at in the K-12 system is a huge amount of inertia. And right now, the system is headed in a direction. And one of those directions is assessment. Right? U.S. government put $350 million into the Smarter Balance and Park Assessments Consortia. There's lots of momentum there. And legislators, whether we like it or not, like assessment. And it's a money train. Right? And money is what drives the system when we talk about system things. You know, and I, I work in government, so you can, you can tell I work in government. So I think we need to think about, in the K-12 space, we need to use the Trojan horses that we have and use the momentum that exists. And we talk about kind of OER and research and what should we be researching. I think at the start, the first thing of research that needs to be done is simply that OER does no less harm than the other stuff. Right? Because the first thing we need to do is simply, and the easiest thing to do, is to recognize that if you simply replace the book that I bought from Pearson or you know whoever with say a CK12 book, you know I mean it, roughly it looks exactly the same basically. It's just maybe it's a PDF file instead, but I can teach my class with absolutely no changes as a teacher because that's an easy adoption for teachers. You know, there's lots of great things I think we see as promise that we can do with electronic media in general, whether it's proprietary or not. But from an adoption standpoint, we've just got to go with the flow. Teachers have a certain way about their business. Give them something that's easy, and that's kind of the notion of falling back to the textbook. And then use that as a Trojan horse. Get OER in there, and the Trojan horse that OER represents is the fact that it's free. Right? But people will say in the US, well, but I don't have a computer. So how is this useful? Right? When Arnold first said, we're going to do these open textbooks in California, everyone said, yeah, but California, you don't have access devices. What's the point? Right? So the point is, if you can prove that OER does no more harm than the other stuff, it's equivalent, and it's just as easy to teach with, you don't have to change anything, but you do need an access device, that's the trick, is getting school systems to start to move at the state, federal, and local levels, cost shift, move the money. Once the money's moved over and they stop buying the book, they start buying the access device, once that momentum hits, now you ride that inertia train, because once they start to go down that road, they're stuck just like we're stuck now in a, a certain rut, and they will have the access devices, that's when you can start to actually change the way you design the OER from a builder's perspective to become this more future version of learning, more socialized, collaborative, these kinds of pieces, because now they have the access devices, which right now is the barrier that's staring them in the face, right? the broadband and the access device. So let them get there by letting them do the things they already know how to do. Get the inertia going, get them to shift their money, because once the money moves, Getting it back, I mean, that's the hardest thing to do in, in government and public policy is to move money, right? Because it was spent here and you've got to spend it somewhere else.
because we're not going to make new money. So that, uh, that's my thought, I guess, is, and, and you know, curious as to what you think about this idea that we need to just go with the flow, get the money to move. Once the money's moved, then we can start doing what we know is the right thing, which is in order to improve education, you have to change your practices. Changing practices is mighty, mighty hard. And I think if we try and do adoption of OER and changes of practice at the same time, you're doomed. It's too much. The system can't handle it. Thank you. Any direct comments to that? Ask the panelists. I, I would only make, I guess, one comment to that, which is that the number of different ways you could change practice and the form of the things that get adopted is quite vast. And so thinking back to Alex's comments and others, is that an OER problem? Or is that just we need to shift <laughs> as many of the bits and pieces of this fairly stable, as Kathy said, ecosystem as we can, do we as a community celebrate any shift? Or do we freak out because the object that was adopted doesn't meet our conception of what OER is? Or because it's being used in a way that we consider to be suboptimal given what we know its capacities to be, right? That does kind of get at the heart of how are we I often ask, like, what would Pearson have to do to get this community to jump up and shout and celebrate other than demolish itself? You know? <laughs> right? Like, what, what, are, what is it that would be seen as positive movement, irregardless of the fact that they might be the ones that are involved in doing it? I, I think in, in history, when there's been disruptive technologies, they happen because it's easy to use and people start using it. I think the more you think about um, changing practices and do, and all these are very relevant. But if we thought about the example of MP3s, you know, we didn't think about using MP3s and thinking, okay, we have to do all this research and we have to think about the practices of how people use CDs and you know, and and and, and we understand that I, you know, education is a very um, sensitive market. But I do think to Hal's point that if there is a unified, easy to use environment to utilize resources for education, that the, that the audience will come. The users will use it. Wikipedia is a great example of that. It is being used in K-12 today, and I don't think that there's been so much research or so much um, thought in terms of changing practice. The practice has naturally changed because the innovation came into that market. And I think innovation, and disruptive enough and easy enough, then change will happen. Hi I'm, <laughs> hi, I'm Patrick McAndrew from the Open University. Um, when we were walking across to dinner last night, went past a, a church on Harvard campus, which got a sign saying it was doing a sermon on the blessedness of brokenness. I don't know what it's really about, but it made me think about uh, <laughs> what, it, what, are, what advantages there are in <clears throat> spotting the bits that are broken mm -hmm. around the system. And we're getting some traction ourselves on work we're doing with uh, sort of entry into community colleges because that's a gap. Uh, there's a gap where you can't get funded work, so sort of free resources are wanted. Are there any sort of broken bits that you can see that really call out for some free solutions? Well, they're easy. I mean, some of this is easy, right? In Chelsea, Massachusetts, one of the broken bits is that students aren't allowed to take books home, right? I mean. You know, some of this is easy, some of this is deep, but some of it is kind of glaringly obvious. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I'm gonna to speak to a specific broken bit. I can think of a bunch, but they're not new. I think what I'm actually interested in is bro broken bits in many ways serve as a um, as raw material for doing interesting things. And I'm not speaking so much from like the builders we must build, but rather from a teaching and learning perspective. So I think part of what makes gravity to say Wikipedia or any of these other places interesting is your perception that it can be improved, right? So it's not done. <laughs> and that works really well for an encyclopedia entry. That starts to break down when you think about other objects that we might take a shared interest in. I mean, are you really gonna, you know, whip out Mona Lisa and say, you know, can improve on it, right? Like, it just doesn't really make any sense. Um, and, and I think there's a tension there between this belief in OER as a enabler of constant iteration and improvement, 
versus OER as a space in which um, people can create and maybe even just recreate simply because they're entitled to do that again and again and again. And it's in the act of doing that that the learning actually happens, not in the product at the end. So, you know, when we look at something as being unfinished, is that a feature or a bug? I think it really depends on what you're trying to do, right? Is its unfinished state actually the best state for the purpose of learning, or is its unfinished state something that people, say the builders in the room, are thinking, oh God, we gotta fix that. Um, I, I think it's a tension that, for the most part, people haven't really resolved in their head. And maybe it differs depending on the objects we're dealing with. I love I, that question. Go ahead. I think Jeff was absolutely correct about um, you know, giving people something familiar that they can um, adopt and use, and use that as a Trojan horse. I think it's a very practical way to go. And I just caution us when we, we bring up um, disruptive models that we don't always just apply um, commercial disruptive models. Because mm -hmm. the market we're dealing in is very different. You've got intersections of uh, for-profit players. You've got policy intersections. You've got local intersections. And so I would be interested to know if there are models, disruptive models, that have taken place in that type of environment. Describe the type of environment you mean. Well, all I mean, those could you, also be commercial environments. So if you look at the education environment where you have, you know, have for-profit players that provide the Pearsons of the world who provide the resources, they're responding to the public sector that sets learning goals and learning standards. And some of these things are out of their control. And that puts a lot of barriers to entry in. And so have, are there any other market examples where you have those types of barriers where disruptive technology or solutions come in and are able to overcome those barriers? <laughs> there are certainly other sectors that are suffering similarly. Medicine comes to mind right away. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I mean, it's a tricky question because you're, you're, you're sort of asking if there is a space in which either the barriers were somehow eliminated through policy reform or just mass movement and then opportunities emerged or where someone slid in sideways and the whole thing just kind of crumbled. Uh, I think we're trying more of the second one, but obviously a lot of the policy level work that is of interest to many people in this room, they're also tackling it the other way. And no, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. I, I think the traditional example, which has little to do with policy, is, is offset printing. Right. Remember, there was a time when you couldn't actually make a reasonable quality, quality printed stuff, right? And mm -hmm. there's still an industry that does very high quality offset printing, but most, for, for most people, you don't have to go through that. And that wasn't a policy issue. It was just some technology came out that made the thing really easy for everybody to do and fulfilled, you know, 85% of the market. Okay, so I've got a sign that unfortunately we are running out of time, but I would like to echo what my uh, co-moderator said, and I encourage you to take the discussion to the cluster meetings, and um, yeah, I think it's time for lunch, right? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs>